Welcome, comrades, to the Spectre of Communism podcast. The Cuban Revolution is a beacon of inspiration to communists, to revolutionaries all around the world. It has been for decades, and today we're going to talk about the Cuban Revolution, about the perspectives of the revolution, about the duty of communists in defending the revolution, and the challenges it faces in the coming period. And to help us, we have Jorge Martin, who is a writer and editor for Marxist.com. So, Jorge, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure. Now, um, those of you who were fans of the previous podcast, the International Marxist Radio, will almost certainly know Jorge's voice well, because he was our most prolific guest by far, and it's great to have you back. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be in this new new podcast. So, um, let's start with the background. Can we talk about the Cuban Revolution in telegraphic form? What happened? Um, why was it so inspirational? What's its significance in the history of revolutionary struggle? I will say the most important thing about the Cuban Revolution is that this is the first and only time that capitalism has been abolished in the Western Hemisphere. And not only in the Western Hemisphere, but in a country that is only 90 miles away from, from the United States, the mm. biggest uh, imperialist power on Earth. Yeah, in the backyard. So that, that is pretty significant. Cuba was the last country in Latin America to gain independence. There's still obviously Puerto Rico who hasn't gained independence, but, but Cuba was the last country to gain independence in uh, 1898. But at the time when Cuba gained independence, the United States was already a dominant imperialist power in the, in the region, in, in Latin America, and immediately fell. It went from being a colony, an open colony of Spain, to being a semi-colony of the United States. For instance, the Platt Amendment, which was uh, introduced in the Cuban Constitution, allowed, gave the United States the right to intervene militarily in the affairs of Cuba. So that, that, that gives you an idea of the, of the level of uh, colonial domination. Cuba was also a country that was producing, it was a capitalist country, but there were big landed states, uh, and the main export crop was uh, sugar. And the sugarcane plantations and the sugarcane crop was completely dominated by U.S. multinational uh, interests, multinational companies. So there was a, a domination which was political, but also economic domination. Uh, the majority of Cuban uh, workers were seasonal uh, workers uh, living in very poor conditions. While at the same time, Cuba was, as uh, many of you have seen, have seen in the in the Godfather, the the, play, the playground for the rich and powerful, for the mafia from the United States. It had casinos, cabarets, and so on. Uh, it was a country that had no national sovereignty; it was completely dominated. It was a very unequal society. And against this is the is that the the revolution uh, uh, came up, the the 1959 revolution had the main aim of national liberation and uh, and the other main main point of the revolution was a thoroughgoing agrarian reform. So it didn't start as a socialist or communist revolution? Not at all. In fact, the Communist Party in Cuba at that time, in the 1940s, because of uh, the Stalinist uh, policy, was supporting, uh, was part of, was had uh, two ministers in the Batista government. This is Batista, the dictator, against uh, whom the revolution took place. And so uh, the young revolutionaries in the 1950s in Cuba were, were not attracted by, the, by, by communism because of the failings of, of the official communist uh, party. And their program was, as you, as you said, national and democratic, anti-imperialist for, for agrarian reform. They had the program of also lowering uh, the rents, uh, increasing the participation of workers in the profits of companies, but they never posed the question of uh, socialism. The question of socialism and abolishing capitalism was posed after the revolution, when, when the revolutionaries had come to power mm. and they started implementing their own program of agrarian reform very, very soon because the, uh, the, the, the sugarcane plantations were owned by U.S. multinationals. Very soon, the, the two things rolled into one into another. The, the, the very, very weak and dependent Cuban bourgeoisie was against the revolution, was against agrarian reform, was against national sovereignty, and therefore uh, the task of abolishing capitalism came naturally just by implementing the national and democratic program of, of the revolutionaries. It's a good demonstration of Trotsky's theory of permanent revolution in action, what you describe. That, that's, that's completely correct. In, in backward 
capitalist uh, countries in the epoch of imperialism, the national and democratic tasks cannot be carried out by the so-called national bourgeois, which is completely linked to imperialism, but, it, but it can, they can only be carried out by the, by the workers and peasants coming to power and abolishing capitalism as well. In fact, the Communist Party of Cuba, which at that time was called uh, the Socialist People's Party, the PSP, Mm. They had a policy of what uh, they, they described as two stages. Right. The, the revolution had to go to, through two different uh, phases. The first, a national democratic one, in which the workers had to uh, support the progressive bourgeois, so-called, which, which didn't exist in Cuba. And then only later on, after a period of independent capitalist development, the question of socialism will be posed. Th this position they had not only before the revolution, but also after mm. 1959, when, when the revolutionary government was already in power, they advocated uh, a, a moderate policy of not expropriating capital, not expropriating foreign capital, uh, in order not to scare away the so-called national bourgeois. But the national bourgeois, which did have some representatives in the first governments after uh, 1959, in January, February, March, April, they progressively left the government. One, once uh, Fidel Castro and Che Guevara were, were very consistently implementing a policy of agrarian uh, reform. Mm. Uh, and this scared away the bourgeois, but the bourgeois had no, no uh, social weight, no importance. The revolution continued forward. By 1962, that is three years into the revolution, capitalism had all had been all but abolished completely in in the island as a result of the first the expropriation of foreign capital and then the expropriation of what little there was of national uh, capital. We could spend a whole episode easily, probably several episodes, on the Cuban Revolution as such, but. We're going to talk about the attitude of communists towards Cuba today. And the first thing I think we should outline are the accomplishments of the revolution. What were the fruits of the hard struggle of the revolutionary valor of the Cuban workers and uh, broader masses? When, when the revolution uh, triumphed in uh, January 1959, there were a whole number of measures that were implemented that uh, massively improved the living conditions of the of the masses. Amongst them, just to mention some, one was first first of all there was the the freezing of uh, rents, but this was followed very quickly afterwards by the expropriation of all houses of all dwellings in uh, the main cities, which now became the property of those people who lived in them. Just imagine. If, if, if this is a very easy way of solving the housing uh, problem, which is which is uh, dire in in many uh, advanced capitalist countries today, um, then there was the agrarian reform, which was very thorough uh, going and, and solved the problem of the of the millions of peasants and and uh, landless uh, laborers. Then there was the 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 education. There was a, a, a program of uh, li a literacy campaign in which literacy, illiteracy was abolished. And to this day, Cuba has the highest uh, level of literacy anywhere in Latin America and compares favorably with advanced capitalist uh, countries. And then the other one, uh, main gain of the revolution, I will say, is, is in the field of uh, healthcare. Uh, healthcare provision in uh, Cuba is second to none. Cuba exports uh, doctors to other countries and there are more doctors per capita in Cuba than there are in uh, the United States mm. or in Britain. And life expectancy up until very recently was higher in uh, Cuba than it was in the United States, which is uh, an advanced capitalist uh, country. Mm. I remember during the COVID pandemic, um, Cuban doctors were greeted as heroes in a number of countries, although they were blocked by Bolsonaro in Brazil, if I recall. That's right. Not only this, but during the COVID pandemic, Cuba, Cuba was able to develop not one, but four different COVID uh, vaccines, which are highly effective. And, and, and they carried out the vaccination of the whole population without having to rely on very expensive, patent protected uh, vaccines from, from uh, big multinational firms based in, in the advanced capitalist countries. But, but the most important thing to remember is that all of these conquests of the revolution 
as well as this sense of national pride, national independence, national sovereignty, uh, are, are based, they rest upon the nationalized uh, forms of, uh, of the economy, mm. i.e. the abolition of capitalism. None of this will have been possible without the abolition of, of uh, capitalism. That, that's a very important point to remember. I mean, some would wave away the accomplishments of the Cuban Revolution by saying, well, that's all very well, but there's no freedom in Cuba. You can't say what you want. You can't think what you want. To what extent is that true? What kind of freedom of expression or freedom of debate is there in a capitalist country where right. all the main newspapers are owned by three or four monopoly groups? They feed you the line of the ruling class. And uh, that, that is not really freedom of expression. That's freedom of expression for those who have the money to have access to the mass uh, media. But it's not freedom of expression for workers and uh, ordinary uh, youth. Well, we can say is from the perspective of the international Marxist tendency, a number of our groups around the world have faced repression by the state, by university authorities, attacks in the press for taking a principal position in solidarity with Palestine. You can say whatever you want, as long as it doesn't fundamentally uh, undermine the interests of the of the ruling class. That's the freedom of expression under under capitalism. So any any criticism of Cuba on these grounds is completely cynical. I want to refer back to something you mentioned in passing earlier: the fact that the life expectancy in Cuba, until recently, has been growing and is still very high. But the implication of that is that the revolution is at a dangerous juncture and you've made this point in a number of articles we'll link some in the episode description what are the main dangers facing the cuban revolution today both domestically and also externally we have to remember that the cuban revolution was for many years very closely linked with the soviet uh, union and from an economic point of view this was very favorable for for cuba in the sense that Cuba was selling products to the Soviet Union at prices which were above the prices of the world market, it was receiving products from uh, the Soviet Union at prices that were below the, the world market. Also, this relationship was, was necessary or was forced or upon Cuba because the, the United States, all the way back to 1960, declared a, an economic embargo and sabotage of the Cuban economy. The Cubans had no other alternative but to seek an anyone who will trade with, with them. When the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, 1989-91, uh, Cuba was left on its own in the international scene. And, and they went through a very difficult period, which is called the special uh, period of the 1990s. Uh, the fact that, that capitalism was restored in the Soviet Union and all of the Eastern countries, but it was not restored in Cuba is a testament to, to the fact that the Cuban Revolution was still alive and there was, there was uh, energy and, and the people wanted to resist. They knew what restoring capitalism would mean right. for a small Caribbean island. These problems then were eased somehow during the period of the Venezuelan Revolution. There were very close links, very favorable to Cuba. Uh, uh, in, in the 2000s, but then the, Cuba, the Venezuelan revolution also entered into crisis. This is maybe the subject for a, for a different discussion. But the, the fact is that in recent years, and particularly since the, since the pandemic, a whole number of factors have combined to make the situation, economic situation in Cuba very complicated. And these factors are, one, the Trump administration in the United States, which tightened the, the economic noose around the neck of uh, the Cuban uh, revolution. 243 new economic uh, blockade measures against the Cuban uh, revolution, none of which have been repealed by the Biden administration, number one. Number two, the, the high prices of energy as a result, partly of the war in uh, Ukraine, which uh, which made the situation very complicated for Cuba. Cuba imports oil from the world uh, market and it has to pay in hard currency. Then the COVID pandemic itself with the disruption of supply lines, the additional expense of having to vaccinate the population uh, uh, and so on. And this compounded by obviously the, the COVID pandemic meant the, the complete stop of uh, the, 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 the travel tra traveling for, for tourism to, to Cuba, which is one of the main sources of uh, income for, for most of 2020 and 2021. Not a single foreign tourist went to Cuba. 
So, so that, that, that was a big economic shock. All of these factors combined and uh, have made the situation in Cuba in the last few years very, very uh, complicated. Cuba, Cuba is facing a very serious economic uh, uh, crisis. Mm. And I wanted to touch on another thing that um, flows naturally from the points you made about the relationship between Cuba and the Soviet Union and also Cuba and the Venezuelan Revolution, which is the necessity of internationalism. If any worker state is going to survive, if any revolution or revolutionary regime is going to survive, it requires the assistance, friendly relations with other worker states. Uh, and without those, the danger of strangulation by imperialism becomes ever greater. Quite, quite clearly, you, you cannot have socialism in one uh, island. You, you couldn't have socialism in, in a country like, uh, in one country, not, not even in a country like the Soviet Union, which was spanning a whole continent with, with huge natural resources, much less in a small Caribbean island, which furthermore, as, as I said at the beginning, is 90 miles from the United States, which is... Uh, has been attempting for six decades to strangulate it economically. The, the, I will say, to put it in simple terms, that the future, the fate of the Cuban revolution depends on the international revolution. It will be settled on the arena of the international class struggle. We'll come back to that in a moment, but you talked about the dangers and problems that the Cuban revolution faces. What's needed in the immediate term to overcome or at least ameliorate some of these problems um, in advance of a revolution in the region and throughout the world to provide the kind of support that the revolution in Cuba really needs? There, there have been many discussions in Cuba in the last 10 years about the, the measures needed to improve the economic situation in, in Cuba. But in the last three years, because of the, of the uh, aggra aggravation of the, of the economic crisis, this, these measures have started to be implemented. There have been many concessions to private capital, i.e. the opening up, uh, uh, the, the, uh, allowing the creation of private companies, small and medium uh, enterprises, making more concessions to the market, allowing uh, foreign investment in different areas where, where it wasn't allowed before. All of these are concessions to capitalism, which are forced on the Cuban revolution. But we, we have to say this, this can create a very dangerous uh, uh, momentum towards the full restoration of capitalism and, and that will be a complete disaster. So I think that that is quite dangerous. Some people put the example of the NEP, the new economic policy in uh, the Soviet Union and, uh, and uh, Lenin in the 1920s, but uh, the NEP was conceived as a necessary retreat, as, as a concession to capitalism, but, but not as a way forward, no. but, but, uh, but uh, as a temporary concession that had to be made. In Cuba, on the contrary, these concessions to private capital are presented as the way forward, the way in which the, the, we're going to unleash the productive forces and so on. And I think that this is very dangerous. At the same time, when Lenin uh, and Trotsky in the Soviet Union were discussing the, the implementation of the NEP, they insisted in, in trying to strengthen workers' democracy, workers' control, uh, in order to prevent these pro-capitalist tendencies from becoming uh, dominant. I think, I think the same thing should be happening in, uh, in Cuba. Uh, there should be elements of workers' control which do not exist uh, now. And th this is an open discussion. There are many, many people advocating this course of uh, action. But above all, the most dangerous thing is that I, I will say a section, a uh, significant section of the Cuban uh, leadership thinks that this is the way forward, i.e. that going down the route of, of say, Vietnam or China, i.e. making ever greater concessions to private capital, is the way forward for the Cuban revolution. And I will say that this is not the case. In Cuba and Vietnam, these ever greater concessions finally led to the restoration of capitalism. The restoration of capitalism in Cuba will be a complete disaster. If you want to know what capitalism will look like and uh, in, in Cuba, you just have to look at the Dominican Republic or Haiti. It will be a country that will have lost all its uh, economic sovereignty and uh, political uh, independence in which massive inequalities will be uh, dominating with, with the majority of the population living in extreme uh, poverty and a small minority coming out benefiting from capitalist restoration coming up uh, uh, on, on top, and that will be a complete disaster. It will also destroy 
education, healthcare, and all of the gains of the of the revolution. Mm. Just to clarify for anybody listening who's unaware, the new economic policy or the NEP that Jorge mentioned. Uh, was a temporary and partial restoration of capitalism in Russia after the civil war in order to provide a necessary degree of breathing space after the destruction uh, that Russia had faced, after the incredible economic privations, the huge loss of life, the massive destruction of industry. It was a necessary evil, as Jorge explained, that was in- ex- intended to be temporary, but it also caused all sorts of problems. We might return to this question in a future episode. But the last thing I wanted to ask you, um, and I think it's the most pertinent thing for most of the people listening to this, because I suspect most of them won't be in Cuba, although I hope some are, um, what is the duty of communists outside of Cuba, communists around the world, communists who might be listening in the UK, in the US, in Canada, throughout Europe, what can they do to support the Cuban revolution at this difficult time? I, I will say that this is, uh, this is clear. This question has a very clear answer. The duty of revolutionaries and communists uh, outside of Cuba is the unconditional defense of the Cuban revolution. It is, it is our own imperialist governments that are trying to strangulate the Cuban uh, revolution, even from the point of view of pure democracy. By what right does the United States uh, ruling class think that they have have a prerogative for for ruling what the Cuban people should uh, do with their their lives, with their economy, with their political and economic uh, system? Uh, This is a basic duty of anti-imperialism. No, not so long ago, there was a court case here in uh, in London against Cuba by some vulture investment funds that wanted to recover some uh, foreign uh, foreign debt that Cuba uh, owed to different different banks and and companies. Our, our first duty is to oppose our own ruling class and defend the Cuban revolution by all means uh, necessary by organizing solidarity uh, activities. Uh, solidarity pickets by educating the working class uh, around us about the real meaning of the Cuban revolution and also by by educating them about the impact of uh, US imperialist blockade which is also supported by the by the British uh, government uh, and educating them about the gains of the Cuban revolution which are which are an inspiration not only for people in Latin America they are an inspiration for people in in Britain, which suffer from uh, lack of lack of housing, very expensive uh, rents, uh, tuition uh, fees, and a crumbling uh, health service. Mm. And I suppose the other thing we should say is, as we've alluded to, the thing that Cuba really needs is friendly worker states, is allies on the world stage. It puts me in mind of something that Hugo Chavez said when he came to London many years ago, and he was asked by this youngster in the crowd, what can I do to support the revolution in Venezuela? Should I go to Caracas? Should I join a peasant commune? Should I um, enter a a workers-run factory and and support the the planning of the the industry? And Chavez said, no, what you should do is fight for socialism here. The greatest thing that communists could do to support the Cuban revolution would be to win socialism to fight for communism to overthrow capitalism where they are that would be the thing that would break the cuban revolution out of its isolation yeah that's completely correct that i i will say that the two main tasks of communists today in relation to the cuban revolution is one to fight for communism in your own uh, country, particularly uh, uh, those of us who live in uh, imperialist uh, countries. And the second one is also to participate in the political debates that are taking place inside uh, Cuba amongst uh, communists and, uh, and participate uh, in, in a comradely debate about what is, the, what is the best way forward for the Cuban uh, revolution. Because the future of the Cuban revolution does not just belong to the Cuban uh, people. A defeat in Cuba, the restoration of capitalism in Cuba, will be a, a victory for imperialism everywhere and will set back the course of the exploited and the oppressed. Uh, uh, the defense of the Cuban revolution and the spreading of the revolution to other countries will be a victory for our side uh, f- from which we will, we will all uh, uh, benefit. This is not just a question 
uh, of, of revolution in a faraway country about which we know very little. It's part of the international struggle of the working class. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jorge. Um, this was a really enlightening discussion. And one more time from everyone here at the Spectre of Communism, we say solidarity with the Cuban Revolution. Hasta la victoria siempre. And we will see you next week for a new episode on a new subject. 